Hello and welcome to the Knights of Awakening. I'm your host, Justin Bain. Today I'll be spending some time with uh, Jedi L. Christopher Bird from the Jedi Path webpage. Before we get started, I want to remind you that if you want to be featured on the KOA, or you have someone to nominate or a group or an order, uh, drop us a note at knightsofawakening at gmail.com or send us a message through our Facebook page. Christopher Bird is the founder of Jedi Path Academy. His current projects include developing a comic book series and a book on Jedi philosophy. In his day-to-day life, he's likely to be dressed in a kilt or a Jedi robe. The description at the Jedi Path page says, Welcome to Walking the Jedi Path. This is a site dedicated to real-life applications of Jedi philosophy as portrayed in Star Wars media. You will find no promises of any fantastic powers or abilities beyond, beyond those which, you can, uh, which can be obtained through hard work and training. And I want to bring on our guest now, Mr. Christopher Bird. Hello, sir. How are you? I'm fine. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you for, for coming on with us. Um, I, I love the part uh, that, that you're likely to be dressed in a kilt or a Jedi robe. I love that. Well, it's been the summer, and I haven't really been wearing the Jedi robe because it's too warm. But mm-hmm. I usually just I wear, like, the brown cloak as regular the fall, you know. Mm-hmm. But mostly it's been jeans and Star Wars T-shirts or Pokemon T-shirts. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> do you play that – do you play that that uh, Pokemon Go at all? I do, I do. Yeah, I I, I do too. Um, but uh, well, I I say that I do, but whenever I'm out with my youngest, uh, she takes my phone and she plays Pokemon Go and does stuff with my <laughs> Pokemon. And <laughs> but uh, so, so 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 we play Pokemon Go together, I guess. Um, but these days I'm not walking all that great still, so. I get out there every once in a while, but uh, right. it's a fun game. It's a fun game. Yeah, but we're not here to talk about Pokemon Go. No, we're no, 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 stuff. we're not. That, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, um, how long have you been on this path, this this Jedi path? About 11 years. 11 years. I, I actually have the exact I started, which was July 6, 2005, Ooh. and that's when... I wrote an essay because that's, I mean, that's my milieu. I write essays called the establishment of a, of a Jedi religion. That's when I first, that's the very seed that I started thinking about actually applying the Jedi path to real life. Mm -hmm. So, 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 so we know what date you started. What brought you to this path? Well, I, what got me thinking about it was the Jedi census phenomenon. Remember, it started in New Zealand and spread to Australia and other Commonwealth countries where people were trying to get Jedi as a recognized religion in the census. And um, mostly it was done as a joke, right? Mm-hmm. But right. then I got to thinking, I'm thinking it's like, well, why not? You actually form, I don't call it a religion now, but then I was thinking, why couldn't you actually form a religion based mm-hmm. on the mythology of Star Wars? Because I was heavily into Joseph Campbell and the monomyth mm-hmm. and how the myths around the world and culture are, are repetitions of, of the same stories. And Star Wars was just a recent example of that myth. It's like, well... People have been basing religions on myth since time immemorial. Why can't we create a new path based on this modern myth? Mm-hmm. And that's 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 kind of what got the ball rolling. I kind of started off on my own. I wanted to have my own ideas. And then I went out and started seeing the community and seeing that I wasn't alone, that there were other Jedi out there. That took it as seriously as I did. Yeah, I was, I was shocked when I went looking for Jedi. Um, I thought I was the only person in the whole universe, <laughs> and then I, I found a lot of people. Um, are are you open about uh, your your uh, uh, path to people in your life? 
I am. Just about just about everyone knows. It's um because to me being a Jedi is not something you pick up and put down. Mm-hmm. You don't you're not a Jedi just when it's convenient to be a Jedi. You're a Jedi during uh the difficult times or when it's convenient. And um I am open. Uh friends and acquaintances think it's things it's kind of a eccentricity. You know, those closest to me know how important it is to me and and being a Jedi is evident. I mean, not just because I talk about it all the time, which mm-hmm. I do to a great length, but because of how I live my life as a Jedi, as my friend Opie Jedi. I, I remember the first time I got the courage to say it out loud to other people. And since then I haven't shut up. So <laughs> right. it was, it was hard breaking that barrier at first. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. If they don't like it, then I probably don't need them in my life anyway. So, right. Lots of, yeah. Lots of times you kind of have to back up. You have to explain, no, I can't move things with my mind. Right. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that. You know, and kind of kind of explain how we use Star Wars as um, as mythic archetypes mm-hmm. to, to base to base on a, what I call an applied philosophy on instead of instead of fantasy role playing. You know, right? And that was, I, and we're going to get into that later um, because there was something I found very interesting in uh, on your page. That talks specifically about that, but we'll get into that later because I I found that t- t- to be uh, we'll just say I thought it, I thought it was interesting because you do, you don't hear the kind of language that you use um, for that, but uh, we'll get to that later. What uh, did did you find inspiration from any other kinds of paths or f- philosophies that helped inspire you or that do inspire you right. now? Right. So. Um... Around this time when I was new to the Jedi Path, I read this book called The Dharma of Star Wars, which kind of explained uh, Buddhist philosophy in uh, using the milieu of, of uh, Star Wars, you know, kind of using the parallels between Star Wars and Buddhist thought. And that was one of my early influences. And a lot of people recognize the Eastern philosophy influences on the Jedi path. But one thing I'm really into is some Western philosophy that isn't mm-hmm. as well known, mostly uh, the path of stoicism. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Out of the, which came out of the Greeks. And so, so stoicism is about acting virtuously without emotional disturbance, you know, and I, I, and I really think, that's yeah, that sounds pertinent. that sounds that sounds pretty Jedi to me. Yeah, <laughs> right. And it and it comes out of you know and like it's it doesn't seem as exotic as Eastern philosophy. Sure. But I really think that that um, that the archetypes that was grounded in world in many past people recognize the like the influence of Taoism. And stuff mm-hmm. because they're more familiar with it, but but Western traditions, uh, at least in the last generation or two, are a little less known. Mm-hmm. But they were but they were known to George Lucas, you know, because he's he studied these and, and so the big Western philosophy and so it's other and like Socrates is a big. Uh, influence on my Jedi path. His, his quote, um, an unexamined life is not fit to live for a human being. And I mm-hmm. and so I do daily meditation practice as part of my Jedi path. And part of that meditation practice is not just the passive not thinking that we get from Zazen, but really engaging my mind and examining my own thoughts my own processes and come into an understanding of why I think like I think. Mm-hmm. So Socrates and the Stoics, those are my other philosophical influences. I like that. I, I, I've i never had anybody buddy, uh, talk about the Stoics in, in relation to the Jedi, um, but, but it seems to fit. 
It really does. Yeah, it fits really well. So where have uh, where have people seen you elsewhere besides uh, uh, the offline group California Jedi and as well uh, your page? Right. So I've been in a couple videos over at Jedi Living, which is run by Opie McCloud. Mm-hmm. I've been like uh, we did a roundtable in the Jedi Code one time. Um, I watched that and I is, liked it. And one place where I've been seen, but probably not seen widely in our community, is I was interviewed for Playboy Mexico. So Mm -hmm. they did an article about the Jedi Path on the last December when the new movie was coming out on on me in uh, Playboy Mexico. It was in Spanish, and... um, and it and I, I come off pretty well in translation, I think. I like because I did the I did the interview in English and it got and my answers got translated. Right. And there was one answer that the Spanish translation is like, oh, that's so much better than what I said in English. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. You see, for for all those out there that think Playboy is not doesn't have articles, they have articles. This is proof right here. Right. <laughs> all right. So, so Christopher knows this, but for the sake of the audience, um, I wanted to bring Christopher on for for two purposes. Um, of course, the big, the larger purpose was to uh, talk about his webpage and all his works that he's written there. Um, but there was another, but there's another reason. Um, and I want to get this stuff out of the way, uh, so that we can jump into your work and your page. Um, but like I said, we should address a couple of issues before we get deeper into this. Uh, the host of the KOA, including myself had produced content that spoke out against social justice, safe spaces and other related subjects. Uh, and of course, this is this seems to be a dividing point not only in our country um, and parts of the world, but within our community as well. And it's been a really, really hardcore political season. Those of us who produce content for the KOA, those of us who are here currently, uh, we were unable to speak on behalf of those who endorse the social justice and safe spaces and related stuff. I read a few articles that, that you wrote, Christopher. Um, one of them was uh, the Jedi Path. A Force for Justice, and the Jedi Response to Oppression. Right. I reached out and – so, of course, I reached out and asked if you would uh, uh, come on and give us the counterpoint of view for these topics because we just, we just can't do it. I, you know, we, we don't see it that way, um, but we always want to offer a, a fair platform so that we can put all the information out there as best we can and let, and let people decide for themselves. So – Again, I know I said this at the beginning. I, I, I really, really, really am happy that you agreed to come and talk about this with us, um, and then we'll get into, and then we'll get into your work, um, which of course some of it will probably tie in anyway. But I just wanted to kind of address this elephant in the room, so to speak, um, so that way we can move forward. So, what is social justice? Uh, how does it fit in with being a Jedi, in your view, and is it necessary? Um, to be a Jedi and, and endorse. So, um... so, yeah, going back to 1977 and the first thing we learned about what the Jedi were, were the first, almost the first words out of Obi-Wan Kenobi's mouth when he described it. He said the Jedi Knights were guardians of peace and justice. So it seems to me that justice, a sense of justice, to the Jedi archetype, that was their primary function, was to guard peace and justice. So, so when we talk about social justice, or the Jedi approach to social justice, I, I see it on a small scale, really. It's, it has to do with the concept from Michael Sackpole's book, I Jedi, where he talks about your sphere of influence. Should I describe sphere of influence really quick? 
Sure, yeah. Mm-hmm. So sphere of influence is basically where we can affect change uh, in a positive manner. So um, some of us have larger spheres than others, and it really depends on our environment and our ability and just where we find ourselves. When, so in my essay, uh, Force for Justice, I quote my teacher, John Smart, where he says, do small things make a difference? And his answer is absolutely not. They make all the difference. And I think it's acting in these small ways that we can affect justice. So I'm not sure if I'm describing social justice. There's oppressive mechanisms in our society. It's it's not anybody's fault. It's just the way that our society has grown over time that some members of our society are marginalized. And because of this, there's opportunities to do good. There's opportunities to represent these minority point of views, these life experiences share or may not even be aware of. Right? Mm-hmm. So in in wanting to defend justice, we want to, if we have a platform, if we have a voice, give give them what you benefit from. Right? Mm-hmm. We don't want to speak for them for, for those that are marginalized or oppressed. We want to listen to them and believe them. I think. So, so yeah, offering a platform. Ahead. Well, I'm just saying, like, like, like offering a platform for, for them to to express uh, the views um, or their perspective as they see it. Well, or allow them to create their own platforms. Give okay. Them, mm-hmm. Give them. Give. Because this is these are their their stories, right? Right. People mm-hmm. who have been oppressed have been marginalized. And we shouldn't come in with our privilege and say, well, this is the way I think you should express it. Here's something I can do for you. Instead, mm-hmm. rather, the proper response, I think, for a Jedi is to ask, how can I help? Instead mm-hmm. of going mm-hmm. in with your own ideas about this is the way to solve this problem, um, oppressed communities will have their own ideas. And sure. it's more proper, I think, to ask, how can I help? instead of offering what you think is your solution from a place of privilege. Or, 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 or a position of, of say power, like the government, for example. Well, okay. When we talk about the government, let's, let's keep it to the uh, American government. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Well, that's, I mean, that's Even the only you know, experience I have I mean, really. These issues, these yeah. issues. These issues go out, but I mean, but the the American government, we have uh, constitutional ideas, especially mm-hmm. in the 14th Amendment, where we have equal protection under the law. And so all these tribes that we have for equality come, th- come mostly through uh, the interpretation of the 14th Amendment, where we have equal protection. And so, under equal protection, everyone has rights, even those in the minority. And mm-hmm. when, and when these rights are not accorded to them, we have to change the course. We have to address that. But that's kind of that's like big issues. You right, know, right, right. So yeah, that, I, I, and that's something we can't do. But but this is but this is part of our identity as a country, is that everyone is protected equally. Well, I I certainly believe that's how that's how many of us, if not most of us, were raised. I mean, you know, I was 
I was born in the late seventies. Uh, now everybody knows how old I am, but uh, <laughs> I grew up in the eighties, and and it, it it didn't seem like. Um, in, in other words, I was born beyond that point where there was a lot of turmoil, and now you know we've we've seemed to come full circle. But tell me what. Let's talk about safe spaces. I think I All think right. the, the whole idea of safe space seems to be confusing um, for a lot of us. Um, so, so let's talk about uh, what they are and, and why they're important. Um, and one counter view is, is that people, uh, individuals should take personal responsibility for their actions, uh, their emotions and feelings. That's, that's what I get a lot when I hear people talking about it. Um, so, so what, what is a safe space and why are they important? All right. So one thing that I want to address is that those that advocate for safe spaces do not believe that the whole world needs to be a safe space. Right. Which, which, but safe spaces are smaller communities. And the idea of safe space came out of the early feminism movement and also among the, the queer community. So why safe spaces are important is because when you are a marginalized individual, you need a space where you can express your experience among those that share it without derailed, without fearing that it will not be believed where you have to, outside of safe, safe spaces, always have to carve out that place for yourself. Saying, I'm here, I exist. This is my experience. But in a safe space, that's already understood. You're among those that understand the struggle already. And I think, and this, and I think there's even a good parallel for safe spaces that might be a little bit surprising to you. Can you guess what it might be? You broke up there just at the end of your sentence. Okay, so in the Star Wars mythology, we actually mm -hmm. have an example of a safe space. Oh, okay. And that and that would be the Jedi Temple itself. Mm -hmm. It was that would have been my guess. Jedi could be Jedi, their apprentices, without the influence of other forces. Without, you know, you could have a discussion on why the dark side is bad. Without someone, without someone coming in, well, if you look at it this way, the dark right. side okay. really isn't that bad. You know, inter interfering with the, the training process and stuff. But I think I like a bad rap because it came on the radar with the Mizu um, protest last year, mm -hmm. right? Where they tried to create a safe space in a, in a public area. And they right. banned, tried to ban media and they hassled student journalists. And I think that's a poor representation of what safe spaces should be ideally. Mm -hmm. And typical what a safe space is. So the safe, the safe space is to have an environment where you are understood, where your experiences are not going to be, I don't want to say, well, they're not going to be questioned. They're not going to be, dismissed mm -hmm. right and and it could be validating and like I said safe spaces have a unique space and time and they don't need to apply everywhere but but I think there is benefit and utility to having them you see now now, as now, you and I didn't talk about any of this stuff before, right? So, right, right. Um, 
And, and as I sit here and listen to you, you're talking about this stuff, and I can understand <laughs> where you're coming from. But when I read a lot about this and I try to understand, uh, you know, I think most people know this about me right now is that politically I'm middle of the road most of the time. However, when I read from all these different sources and I hear things and, and, and I just think people make it so damn confusing. Like I can't, I, I can't understand, you know, what they're talking about, but so far listening to, to how you're explaining it to me, I mean, I can, I, I can actually kind of see um, how some of this stuff works. Um, but that brings us that brings us to the phrase white privilege. And I think this is the one I think this is the one that really, really hits people hard and they they just can't can't wrap their heads around it. Uh, and and honestly, I'm I'm one of those people. It's really hard for me to to understand uh, what this what this means. So so maybe you could give it a shot and tell us tell us what it's all about. All right. I'm going to I'm going to pivot a little bit. And not just address what's called white privilege, but just the okay. concept of privilege in general. Okay. All right. So when we talk about someone having privilege, it's really more of a contrast to those who do not have it. We're not saying that those that have privilege it or that they should feel guilty about it but rather that they should recognize that not everyone shares it. So now this can be among many axes. There is, of course, race, but there's, but there's also gender, sexual orientation, even uh, religious beliefs. Um, and it's rare that only had one of these axes in play, but rather several of these kinds of oppression. And so what we have to understand is things like classism and racism and sexism are systemic. So I say prejudices are individual. Isms are built right into our society. And we try to address it. But um, so Roz Johnson, a California Jedi, uh, has this great analogy is that we're in society, we're all playing the card game. And some of us get the full deck of cards and other of us have to play our hands with half a deck of cards. Now they can still play. They might even still have some success, but the difficulty is so much greater when you don't have that full deck of cards to play. And when you say systemic, you're talking from the from the very top to to where the laws and actions and things happen down to to the very last person that that that's within that society. Well, mostly, yeah, it's, it's, you know, for many people, the game is rigged, right? Mm -hmm. There, um, there's so much to overcome that they really don't have a fair shot to it. Now we've addressed this with laws and continue to address it, but there's things that you can't legislate. Things like mm -hmm. attitudes and prevailing beliefs mm -hmm. and stuff, and they and they are represented in how our society functions and operates, and it's constantly something that we're adjustments to, usually legislatively through court decisions, but on also again talking about that sphere of influence on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. So when you see when you see it happening among your peers, instead of remaining silent, you speak up. You say, "Hey, this isn't right. This is not congruent with this person's experiences." So one of the things that really got me thinking about um, privilege 
and uh, we don't have the time to really go into it, but I would ask for people to look it up later, and it's called the Blue Eyes, Brown Eyes Experiment, uh, done by Jane Elliott, and there's uh, videos of, on YouTube of her performing this um, experiment, mm -hmm. and what it does is she divides the room those with blue eyes and those with brown eyes. And it's a completely arbitrary distinction. But then she treats usually the, the blue-eyed people as if there was something wrong with them. Like they're mm -hmm. not as smart. They don't follow instructions. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a way to understand racism. And um, it's not a pleasant experience, but it's, if you pardon the pun, it's eye-opening. And so you can go on YouTube. <laughs> I like that. She first, she first did it with school children, which was interesting. She developed it the, literally the day after Martin Luther King was assassinated. I think As I've seen what you're talking teach, about in one you know, form or the other. To, mm -hmm. to try to teach what racism is really like so people can experience what it's mm -hmm. like and the video on you if it's properly licensed or not but it's in two parts and it's a class of college students and so that's the one i would suggest watching and for those because listening i will uh I'll, i was just gonna let everybody know i'll look for that and uh the one you're talking about and i'll put links in the description of the show here so people can click on it and check it out great great so, okay, so have I described privilege satisfaction? Um, do you have a little bit more I, understanding I, of what it is? I do. I I think all of this culminates to my last question for you um, regarding in social justice. And uh, talking to you, I think, I think most of us uh, uh, kind of, you know, fall into to, uh, agreeance on, on most of it. I just think the way that it's portrayed, uh, for the most part, seems to to, to skew what the intention is, um, because you, you know, and, and of course, I guess it depends on where you live and what you watch and things like this. Um, because of the KOA, I watch all different kinds of things, stuff that I may or may not would watch uh, otherwise. But I try to get as big a picture as I can because when I put out information, I want, I want to try to do the best I can. And, 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 and like I said, sometimes I just can't. And, you know, I'm, I'm a human being, so it, it is what it is. But Right. So I, I, think, I understand this because when someone says you have privilege or white privilege, there's a reaction, right? Right. And you say, my life is difficult. I've had mm -hmm. these experiences. I've done things by my own merits. But a proper Jedi, a Jedi of quality, doesn't react. We respond. We have a reasoned response. And so when we unpack the idea of privilege, like I've, there's been periods where I've been very poor. I was not secure in where I would get food. I was not secure in my housing. Now, these are real struggles that I had. But the thing is, though, the, I didn't have these struggles because of the color of my skin. Right? Why? So how do we take that? To my struggles. And that's not, so and that's not, that's not the case for people of color. They're, their race becomes a barrier in some mm -hmm. respects, a barrier that I didn't have, even though I was disadvantaged for quite some time. And I think you hit it right on the head um, because I think that's where the disconnect is. Uh, when people hear, um, and, and, and let's be honest, the media likes to label it beyond privilege. They'll say white privilege or they'll say, you know, something like that. Uh, and, 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 and in my heart of hearts, I think they're trying to incite a reaction in, in many different ways. 
Um, whether it's, you know, whether it's out of cruelty or whether it's out of trying to just make money, I think it's probably, they're just trying to get hits and views and try to get money or whatever. But, um, I think, I think that's disconnect because, you know, many of us will say, well, come on, man. I, I lived in ghettos too. I mean, I personally lived in ghettos like you, um, where, where, where I was the only white family raising kids in an entire area, um, because that's what I could afford at the time, you know? Um, but I think, I think that's where the disconnect is. I think you, I think you kind of nailed it. Um, so I think, I think most of us, it, it, and hopefully all of us could agree that there are some out there and I'll, I'll point out that it's, it, that, that it's a small few, I'm sure, um, that use these, these types of beliefs or these political um, leanings for violence or they express these beliefs through violence. I don't think any of us agree that that's really helping anyone, um, but, but they do seem to be the loudest. At least that's who we get to see all the time because that's who they put out there for us to see um, the media for the most part. Any thoughts on those who, who commit or condone violence uh, against anyone in the name of social justice? Well, I'm, I'm, I really can't speak to that because I'm not sure what examples you're uh, pertaining to of people using violence for uh, social justice. I, would, I typically, because of my background in Aikido, have a philosophy of nonviolence and positive conflict resolution, right? So that would, so when I'm seeking social justice that I take, and it's the path of those that I associate with take. Now, um, I can understand the frustration that would lead someone to do a violent act without condoning it, right? So I don't condone violence, but I can Mm -hmm. understand the place of hopelessness where someone would think that's the way. But so it's like, so we need to, I mean, that's another thing in the Star Wars mythology. It's all about hope, engendering hope. Mm -hmm. And I can see... I can I can truly truly understand the the uh, what could drive somebody to violence as well, but on the other side of that, I could I could also see how people would react when they see violence, and then and it just it just seems like that's that's the narrative that gets steered, like all the stuff that we've been talking about over the past uh, you know half hour is stuff that I think a lot of people it would help people think a little uh, deeper about the the topic. Versus what we see on TV, whether it's CNN, Fox, whoever, you know, um, because they 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 just seem to show all the stuff that when stuff comes to a head and people are fighting and, and shooting each other and all this other you oh, know, you're, stuff. So you're talking so you're talking about the response of a riot. Is that? Oh uh, well, well that's I mean I mean that's some of it like, too. Like the- but right. But there have been some isolated. There have been some isolated issues like uh, at political rallies, things like this, where people just have just lost it and they're beating the crap out of each other. And and you know, when I grew up, growing up, I I remember growing up where where if people had different political views, for example, um, you, you know, they would kind of argue a little bit. But for the most part, it wasn't. You know, people didn't beat the crap out of each other. Or, or, yeah, they didn't run each over, run over each other with cars or whatever, and it just seemed like a different time. And, and of course, it probably was. I mean, I, I mean that's that's probably the most obvious statement I've ever said. But <laughs> but I don't remember the turbulence uh, of the '60s and '70s, of course, because I wasn't born then, and and I can only know what people have told me about those times. Uh, right, I was from very what, young in the '70s, but I do have some early memories of, of stuff. Cause and of the Vietnam War, even though it mm-hmm. was, you know, I was just a kid, so it wasn't, but, but those kinds of protests and stuff were kind of on my radar, and I think, mm-hmm. so it's like, and of course, my interest in the era, in, in high right. school, you know, learning it was history then, but it was recent history of, of the protest movements, and protest movements 
go back. I mean, we have the suffragettes in the mm-hmm. early 20th, the late 19th and early 20th century, where they would chain themselves to to mm-hmm. the White House fence and stop demanding uh, the right to vote for women, which right. is only and it, which which has only been since 1920. I mean, we just passed the anniversary of the passing of the 19th Amendment. You know, it's and and then and even though we have the 19th Amendment guarantee, it didn't guarantee all women to vote. We had to have the Voter Rights Act in the 1960s and stuff mm-hmm. before people of color were completely franchised. And I still and I still think there are things. Where we're trying to disenfranchise um, people of color from the polls, like e- mm-hmm. even though it's it's illegal, there's there's still mechanisms that are trying in our democracy that we still have to address. But about violence, no, I don't condone violence. I just wish we could, you know, it's just wishful thinking on my part. And, and, and I think I said something similar to this in, in, in a video I did um, on this topic. But, but I just wish we could go back to let's sit down and talk about it, man. You know, I, I just I, I hate seeing people uh, well, being killed or, 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 you know, being beaten and, and or beating each other up because they just, you know, as Jedi, we teach that that violence is the last resort. You know, and, and it's only used to defend. And when you see people just at their wits end and they're just it's just a slug fest. Um, and, and it breaks my heart that we're so div- it, 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 and maybe we're not divided. Maybe this is just what I'm seeing. Um, but it just seems like especially this, this political cycle is really taking a toll on everybody. Um, you know, I, I, I have to unplug from Facebook some days just because I'm so sick of seeing it. And uh, maybe it's because we're so much better at telling each other things than we were back in the day. I just, it breaks my heart. I wish we could figure out a better way to to figure it out. Well, the better way is to give people a voice where they are heard and they are believed. Like, because it's it's not a popular quote, but Martin Luther King, who believed in the nonviolent protests modeled on Gandhi. He said a riot is the language of the unheard. It's when the political process breaks down, when a people is are so oppressed and they don't have a platform, they'll take they'll become more radical. And so if you want to stop riots, then you have to give those that are oppressed a voice. So again, it's it's systemic problems that have to be addressed from the bottom up and from the top down. All right. So, anything else? I mean, do you have any final thoughts on this before before we continue on? I just I just really wanted to get. Um, well, another another take on this on, on this stuff because you know it it's really hard. I mean, it's a really hard topic for people who who aren't involved, you know, or aren't neck deep into it to to understand. Um, I don't have any. I, don't, I really don't have any closing thoughts. On okay. It, I think I think we covered things. Uh, it's something I'll, I'll share. You know, the old staircase wit, right? Something that will occur. Right. No, oh, I'm sure right now, I think there's got to be a, a certain special someone um, when this thing hits the page, uh, you know, tomorrow, the next day, there's going to be a special someone who's going to tell me I didn't ask you enough questions or or I was mean to you or something. So, you know, it's OK. It's the, it's the nature of our business. Right. This is what we do. So. <laughs> right. Anyway, it's okay. So I want I want to thank you for for the for the opportunity to explore this. It's like I think there are people that uh, better, but I was the guy picked. So I thank you for that. Well, I I just you know um like I was telling you before the show, uh, 
I I spend a lot of hours on the KOA. I, I don't think people can see that. And, and and I know a lot of it is is done in planning and trying to to find things um, to talk about things. But but the the thing I like doing the most is sharing other people's perspective. That's kind of that's my favorite thing to do. But sometimes, sometimes I, I, I will share my perspective, and then another host will share theirs and theirs and theirs. Almost, almost every time, there was always a different perspective that we could count on to, to counter the other one. So it was never – but in this, in this uh, set of topics, we all had the same kind of view. And, you know, that, that, that – and, and, and somebody's going to say – Probably that same special someone I was talking about will say that I'm just pandering. I'm not pandering to anybody. I'm trying to get as much information out there as I can. Um, and look, I'm not so I'm not so so awesome that I think that I know everything. And that's why I reached out to you and to help me with this because it's just something I couldn't talk about, you know. Um, and again, I, I you know I I, I appreciate it. Um, so. Anyways, now that yeah. I've ra- rambled myself into a corner, <laughs> uh, let's talk about your page, the Jedi Path, with it, which right. is where I found which is where I found you um, in the first place, and I read those things that that helped me think about those other things. But let's talk about the Jedi Path. Um, when right. did you start that page? I know I didn't send you this question, but but I'm just curious. When did you start this this page and get it going? Started it in um, 2012, April of 2012, is when I started the website. Uh, I started off with JediPath.org, right? That's the main mm-hmm. website. I think I got a great domain name. I think I got the best domain name in the Jedi community, right? Jedi- I, I know. You grabbed that. You. <laughs> you- how, how was that night? How was that name not taken? I mean, I was looking at that. I was like, man, he must have he must have started this page out in the '80s or something, because there's no way that name was available. Right. I was just very lucky. <laughs> I I own I own three Jedi Path domains. I have JediPath.org, which was the front site. I own JediPath.com, which just redirects. And then when they came out with these new top-level domains that I really liked, I, and this is the one I usually link on Facebook when I link my essays and stuff, is JediPath.academy. So if you type JediPath.academy, it's a, my website. But I started it in April of 2012. It was after um, I had removed myself from the online Jedi community, and I would, and I did what my friends call my hermit phase, where I just mm-hmm. went off and I studied Jedi on my own because I because I found the online community to be kind of toxic. So, and I would just I would poke in every few years. I would see all the same arguments, doing the same thing, and withdraw again. <laughs> and then when I got to the place. Where I thought, okay, I think I got a good handle on this Jedi thing. And I said, well, I'm going to start putting it out there publicly. And I started writing essays in, uh, on, on the Jedi path in uh, 2012. So that's, that's, that's how it started. Because I thought, I thought I was in a place where I had a pretty good handle on it. And I wanted to put it out there and see if any reaction. Did you get a reaction? Oh, uh, a little bit, but not – building community is hard. <laughs> it, it is. It is, you it know, is really we had, hard. We had, a, we had a forum for a while, but I had to take out the forums because it was just overrun with spam, and I couldn't yeah. administer it. And I have now instead um, comment sections with um, – Using uh, discuss d i s q u s s the discuss plugin, which seems to work pretty good. And then I started uh, the Facebook page, uh, Jedi Path on Facebook. It's just Facebook.com/slash Jedi Path. We'll get you there. One word. And so I get engagement on the Facebook page, comments, 
shares, likes, you know. But most of the time, I feel like I'm doing this in a vacuum. I don't get a lot of <laughs> engagement, really. But every once in a uh, while, but I get like like when Playboy Mexico contacts me and says, "Oh, we want to talk to you," and when Knights of the Awakening said, "Hey, we want to talk to you," it's like, okay, so I have. There is people seeing it. It's not all in vain. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. But I don't I, really. I want you. I'm surprised. I want you I'm surprised to, that I read. I, I I want you to listen to me, brother. Okay. I, I feel your pain. <laughs> I, and, and, and I'll tell you why I feel your pain, because in the last eight years, I have spent thousands, thousands of hours uh, doing stuff for the KOA. And it, it is hard to get feedback on stuff. So, so you, you know, you're sitting here and you're going, well, I've had 75,000 people watch or, or listen to the shows at Blog Talk, you know. And I'm thinking 75,000 people have listened. How come nobody ever sends me a, a, a note? <laughs> you know, either, either we right. are doing the most fantastic job ever to be done or people just, are, they just want to listen and move on. And I, you know, I, well, I, I have to think it's the latter. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, there was actually a study done is that when engagement happens on websites and on Facebook, it's when people disagree. And when they disagree strongly, that's when they want their voice to be heard. But so I see, I see the role kind of an acceptance. <laughs> you know? Yeah, and 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 I would agree with that 100. It it just it just sucks because you know um, I could say it a million times that that my perspective is certainly only one in a one little drop in a tiny or in a giant giant bucket, and I know there's more out there. And, you know, you don't have to take my word for it all the time. And we used to say this all the time, David and I, back, back in the day when I had my, my cohort, David, uh, we, would, we would say it all the time. You know, you don't, don't take our word for it. You use the information and dig deep, dig deeper for it, you know, find, find what you got to find. Um, but, but I feel you there. So let's talk about the force. What is the force right. in your view? Okay, so my... My view of the Force, I think, is uh, a minority opinion within the Jedi community. And I see the Force as an internal phenomenon. It comes from within us. And when I say I want to use the Force, what I mean by that is I'm inculcating positive mental traits that are portrayed by the archetypal Jedi. Right, stuff like calmness, being at peace, uh, the principle of non-attachment, um, being virtuous, being brave. Right. So by reaching down inside myself, we see this almost unlimited human potential that we can tap, and it's and it's within all of us. And um, so that's one part of the force. And the other part of the force where I don't believe it's mystical, but I do believe that everything is interconnected and interdependent. This kind of like thing depends on every other thing, basically. And so this kind of ties in in the mythology of how the force ties all things together and it binds us is that the connection that we have with other individuals is a real thing. And I think that's just, that's another aspect of the force is being connected to those around us and everything around us, the ground we walk on mm -hmm. and breathe and stuff like that. That's about as metaphysical as I get, cause I'm, I'm pretty non-mystical. <laughs> <laughs> You could not, you couldn't tell by looking at your page at all. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's really hard to talk about the force sometimes, you know, it, it, it's, it's really hard. And when you ask people from, you know, from all over, what do they think it is? You get so many different answers. That's why it's always, you know, one of the first questions I always ask a Jedi. Right. Or, if you or, ask, if you ask three user, Jedi. 
If you ask three Jedi what is the Force, you'll get five answers. <laughs> yeah. Yep, because someone's always has someone always has two. <laughs> um, so, so speaking of aspects, um, the community it's it's an awesome thing because you have a community of individuals for the most part, and it's it's really hard to to nail stuff down. It's like it's like trying to I don't know chase a lemur or something, you know, uh, something really fast, but what is your, well, I, I'll, I'll ask you like this. You wrote an article. Some of my best friends are Sith. Right. Um, how do you, how do you feel about the aspects within the force and, and, and tell us about that article a little bit and where you were coming from? All right. So best friends are Sith. It's kind of, uh, it came out of contrasting, um, the fictional Jedi with what we do in real life. So like in the fiction, the Jedi and the Sith, their missions are to destroy each other. The Sith want to destroy the Jedi. The Jedi want to destroy the Sith, right? But here in the real world, we can't go out and just destroy our enemies, right? And I do, I really that identify as Sith just as sincerely as I identify as a Jedi. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, though, and while some of our core beliefs are antithetical to each other, there is still that common ground. We have a common language, and we have an understanding of each other. That is kind of base your life philosophy on a piece of fiction, but we do it. <laughs> you know, is it, was there something specific in that article you were curious about or? No, I just, uh, I, well, I, I like that article because you and I are very much of the same mind on this uh, because, and, and I'll just say it like this. Some of the best Jedi I know call themselves Sith and some of the, some of the uh, 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 more Sith like, people call themselves Jedi. And, you, you know, from time to time, we come across people like that, where uh, you'll find a Sith who does more in their community than, than a lot of Jedi do in theirs. And uh, I just agree. Right. I, 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 I just, you know, I just agreed with it. You know, one of my Sith friends is a doctor, something you think would be based in uh, compassion and right. stuff. But, uh, She's a she's a brilliant doctor. She's opening her own practice, and it's like, but she believes, you know, in like you know principles of power and stuff like that. Sure. You know, sure. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not very conversant in in the Sith stuff. But well, it, and and it's really hard. It's really hard because uh, it's easy for the Jedi to take from the canon, or not from canon, but from the fiction. And apply that. It's really hard for a Sith to conquer the United States of America or China or something. You know, it's really hard to apply that 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 direct uh, relation to the fiction so for them. What so I, what I what well where the Jedi and the Sith are the real life Jedi, like you and I are Jedi, and mm-hmm. my friends are Sith. What um what they're primarily about is self improvement, right? Mm-hmm. So the Jedi, we improve ourselves to make the world a better place. As yeah. Opie says, uh, self, world betterment through self-betterment. Mm-hmm. Sith are just as interested in uh, improving themselves, but it's, they're improving themselves so they have a better life, right? So things right. are better mm-hmm. for, for them, right? But we're both in the in in the um, in the process of improving ourselves, and the way we do it is different. Our motivations are different, but the similarity is is that we version ourselves. Well, I I thought I I've always thought the Sith were better dressers too in the fiction. You know, if <laughs> I'm kind of partial to black, you know, I don't know why. Maybe 
maybe uh you know there's some some past life issue that I had or something maybe but uh uh let's talk about codes or mantras um all right is there one that you that you uh uh use and teach and uh why why do you like that well, one well i use i use the five line code right the one that begins there is no emotion there's peace there is no ignorance there is knowledge there is no passion there is serenity there is no chaos there is harmony and there is no death there is the force that's that's my one mantra that's the code i follow and i also i like the other way to motion yet peace the yeah, ignorance yet, yet mm-hmm. knowledge like i like i like both versions but where i am right now i'm in the first form where there is no mm-hmm. i like it because it sounds absolutist but if you take an absolutist view of it, it falls apart. And the yeah. Jedi view is a nuanced view. And when you take a nuanced view of the code, you have to do surface reading. You have to understand why it says what it says. You know, and it's like, and even, and like, and so the Jedi code, it was created for a role playing game. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It was just it was just something to help people pretending to be Jedi to to play their character more realistically. But the thing is, though, it has real benefit and utility, and it has real depth to it. Like you can unpack the for years. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's more that you can you can do real exegesis with the Jedi with the with the Jedi code. And I think I think it's a brilliant piece of writing, and it has lots of lessons to give us. Yeah, I so think I don't, uh, I don't think the code itself. I think the code itself is important, but the more important part of the code is thought processes that come from when you examine it. Again, that's that's that Socratic method of of examination. Yeah, I, I uh, actually just just had a discussion with someone um, offline. Uh, well, not offline, but in private about codes and mantras. And the argument was, well, I I don't have I shouldn't have to have a code to do good. And I said, well, then think of it as a mantra. You know, um, you, you you plant whatever you plant in your garden is what's going to grow. And it's always good to have a reminder of what your focus is. I always thought the the Jedi code and, and 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 there's a few different versions of it um and I like them all. I I don't I don't have a favorite. Well, I guess if I did have a favorite it would be the yet. Uh to me that's mm-hmm. to to me to me that just feels a little more uh in line with, with with what we deal with in real life. But I don't think there's anything wrong with having a code to 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 or or mantra to focus us at least onto what we're trying to do. Um, or, or where we're trying to be, you know. Right. Well, speaking of Star Wars fiction, how big of a role does that does that universe play on your path? All right. So I do something that I find beneficial. And again, we talked about that fantasy role playing, right? Mm-hmm. And so I like to role play. I I usually do it. In uh, in Second Life, which is this immersive 3D environment, mm-hmm. and so it's like in my in my Second Life role play, I'm not Christopher. I'm Master Zen, the archivist of Yavin 4 for the Calway Order of the Jedi, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's and it's a role I've played for years, but within the Star Wars environment, I'm big mythic issues you know it's like these moral dilemmas that can only happen in fiction you know and so the fictional universe is inspiration but it's not to be practiced slavishly at least in our applied philosophy in the real life so I don't think 
saying because a Jedi did this in a movie, it belongs in the Jedi path, right? We got to we got to examine. Like, yes, it could be an inspiration, but does it have utility and benefit? And if it doesn't have utility and benefit, then it's what I call cruft and should just be ejected. <laughs> you know, it just it doesn't mm-hmm. have doesn't have a place. You know, I, but 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 role playing allows me to within the mythic narrative how to be a Jedi. And so what I do in my real life informs the role play I do in Second Life. And the role play I do in Second Life sometimes inspires me. It's like, oh, this has this has these applications to my real life. You know, I discover them through play. Which and playing is the first way that we that we learn as children. And I think is an adult. <laughs> This is gonna this is gonna floor some people, but I'm gonna tell this this quick story. Many years ago, I was sent on a real life diplomatic mission to Second Life. I went to this place and I, I was freaking out. I didn't know what to do. I had to build uh, this person and I had to build this. Um, uh, I couldn't use my name because, of course, all the cool names were taken. So I <laughs> I right. I had the name. I had the name Bane Darkstone, and I was sent to uh, the order uh, Jedi Guardians of, of Peace. Is, is that right? Jedi I don't Guardians. know. I, th- I mean, how, JGP? How long ago? Oh, man, it was remember. a long time ago. It was a long time ago. They used to, they, they used to have land at a place called Osis. Oh, yeah. Okay. Now I remember. They had a library there. Yes. Yes. And yes, I remember that. Now I remember that. So, so I've yeah. never uh, uh, actively actively role played like that, other other than playing uh, like video games where where you have to make choices, like um, um, Knights of the Old Republic. Like Knights of the Old Republic. Yeah. Yep. That's what got me on the Jedi path to begin with. Was Knights of the Old Republic. I was like, this is awesome. Um, but I, I I went to this place uh, representing the Order of Ashland, the Jedi Order of Ashland Knights at that time. And I went and, and, and met these folks, and they were, you know, hardcore role players, but they were also Jedi realists. And yes, I remember some, that about them. Some of the best. Some uh, how do I put this? Some of the some of the deepest uh, uh, contemplations that I had was in the middle of a role play, and I'm horrible at it. I'm not going to lie. They're, they're probably thinking, "Who the hell is this guy? This guy's this guy's a square," but. I played along and I tried my best, um, but to, to, illust- to, to illustrate your points, a lot can be learned by, by, by practice. And you know, you you should practice how you're gonna. Uh, uh, you should train to what you're to what you're trying to do, and if that's through play, then then more power to you. If that's through whatever else, you know, train how you, what's best for you. And I loved it. Right. I thought it was awesome. You know, I mean, the place is all shut down now. I, I, I actually, I, it's so funny you, you bring up Second Life because I thought to myself a couple of weeks ago, I was like, you know what? I'm going to go check those guys out again. I'm going to go go say hi and, and catch up with them because it's been years. Um, and of course, I go there and everything's all tore down. It's like some kind of weird resort now or something. And they kept kicking me out. <laughs> right. The- so, so consider this an open invitation. You could do an area search for Yavin 4, Yavin IV, right, in mm-hmm. Second Life. And that's where my Jedi Order is based that I role play in. It's great to have other Jedi come in and go through. We have our training system. We have a curriculum that we put our Padawans through before they graduate to mm-hmm. Jedi Knight. It could take a month or it could take several months depending on how you do. And it just it's a it's a great experience. And so I you have an, you have an four in Second Life. You can come find us. I'm Zen Mondo Wormser. Do a search for that and I am me. You keep saying Yavin four and I swear I swear it just seems familiar. I, I there's a Yavin 
on my little um, – you know how you bookmark uh, areas in, in your little uh, map thing or whatever? Right. Um, Yavin is uh, is in there. I don't know exactly where, but uh, uh, I'm going to take you up on that offer, and I'm going to go check it out because I look really weird um, be- because I m- my guy is dressed like a Jedi, and he has these uh, Wolverine, la- uh, Wolverine lightsaber claws, which are the most <laughs> awesome thing I've ever seen in my life, by the way. And, <laughs> and, and, and I'm flying around, and people keep kicking me out of everything, so I need a place to go. So I'm going to check you out. I'm going to take you up on that right. offer. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I, I just thought it was the coolest thing I've seen because I love, I love the fact that it was just a different way to do the same thing we're all doing, and I just love that about it. Right, um, and there's – No, go ahead. I'm sorry. I recently – like someone in my virtual order, the, you know, the Cowboy Order of the Jedi, or we just say KOJ, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, when I got back from the national gathering, I was talking about it. It's like, wait, people do this in real life? I'm like, yeah, people <laughs> do this in real yeah. life. And it's like, where do you live? Well, I live in Sacramento. It's like, oh, well, I have an offline group for California Jedi. So I've gotten so I've gotten a player from Second Life inserted into the offline. <laughs> that is awesome. In California Jedi, and like, and so it's like, and it's. So it's it's great place to just foment, you know. Mhm. Mhm. Mr. Bird, how do you view how do you view good and evil? What does that mean for you? All right. So this is something that predates coming to the Jedi path, but it's compatible with the Jedi path. I struggled with idea in my early adulthood like what the definition of evil is. And what I came up with is that what evil is, is the causing of any unnecessary suffering. So I came up with a moral code and it's still the moral code that I live by today. And it's like, do nothing or allow to happen through it anything that would lead to unnecessary suffering. And I, I lived that code for uh, years and years, but it was incomplete because just the lack of suffering is not what good is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Good is not the absence of suffering. And so I added a second line to my code and it's like whenever possible, contribute to the happiness of others. Hmm. So, mm-hmm. so evil is the infliction of suffering. Good is enculturating happiness or kindness. Compassion in action is what I say. So, I mean, it's, it's a brief... Definition, but that's that's my working definition of good and evil. <laughs> huh. That's all that matters if it works. I mean, you know, and and, and the only reason I ask that question is uh, oftentimes people confuse, it, it, in my view, people confuse light and dark with being good and evil, and and I just don't think it's clear cut uh, like that. Um, you know, because some something can be illuminating. But not be very good sometimes. You know, it can be a bad thing too. Right. Yeah. The, the, so it's like, so good and evil comes, I, I usually make the distinction between moral action and immoral action. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and I believe there are some things that are absolutely immoral. But those things, is a very small number where because these there there are some actions that in no matter the context will result in, right mm-hmm. stuff like slavery stuff like rape there's no outcome where that's justifiable but there's but there's other things that are not so absolute like like my usual go to thing is is lying 
a lot of people will say lying in every circumstance is immoral, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, would, you would agree that's a commonly held belief, right? Sure. But I mm-hmm. say depending on the – there are times when lying is the moral action to take, right? And sometimes if you tell the truth without compassion, it can be used to harm. So sometimes telling the truth is actually the immoral action. And so it's like, and you know, it's something. So people want uh, an example when I talk about this, right? I I lived in Amsterdam. And I lived on the Prinsenkracht, which is a canal in, in the central of Amsterdam. And on that canal, is another house that's more famous called the Anne Frank house. And everyone Mm -hmm. knows the story of Anne Frank, her and her family, Jewish family, hidden in a hidden attic room on this canal house in Amsterdam. Now, when the Germans come and knock on the door, you hiding anyone, Mm -hmm. what's the moral thing to do? Hmm. Yeah. What's the, yeah, it's, it's to lie. The, I mean, the, the I mean, I, your pants up, that's right. Right. Yeah. Because if you told the truth, that would result in the death of an entire innocent family. Now, I mean, I mean, that's how this tragic story ends. I mean, mm-hmm. they were found and were put in camp and Anne Frank died. But while they were being hit, the proper thing, the proper moral right action was to lie about it. It's I mean, funny you I mean, used... We kind of go, go into Godwin's law there, because I, mean, I am talking about <laughs> Nazis and stuff, but and that's an extreme example. But again, well, I, but the truth I mean, without I, compassion can be used to harm. Sure. I, I use... I actually use that as a question when I'm interviewing uh, prospective employees. I ask them, is it ever okay to lie? I ask them straight up during the interview, is it ever okay to lie? And the truth is, yeah, sometimes it is okay to lie, you know? Um, Right. um, A lot of people say, oh, no, sir, no, sir. Uh, No, I'm not a liar. Look, I know you're a liar. We all lie. Um, but what I what I want to know is why would you lie? You know, that that's what I care about. So, <laughs> you know, um, no, right. that's always I mean, a good there's example. There's lots of times where where lying is immoral. I mean, most of the time, I would say lying is immoral, but not mm-hmm. universally. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Let's talk Again, about the, the article. You... Approach is a nuanced approach. <laughs> yeah, it it is. Yeah, go ahead. No, I, no, I, I would agree with that. Uh, you wrote an article called "Competition in the Jedi Path on Winning and Losing." Tell us about that. Right. Okay, so these are ideas I had for a while before writing the article, but this was actually inspired by my experiences at the California Jedi Gathering in April, and we were introduced to this game called uh, Cutthroat Uno. Right? It had all these additional rules. And it was a lot of fun. But it turned out that me personally was kind of unbeatable at Cutthroat Uno. And it took people playing and ganging up and cheating, like, like make it like everyone, everyone else knew what everyone else's cards were and they were cable talking on how to beat me and they finally beat me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, um, but at the but the thing is but um but the Jedi view on winning and losing kind of comes back to this idea of it. now I think co- competition can be a healthy thing and when I compete I do my best to win but where the non-attachment comes in is that I'm not attached to a winning outcome it's like I don't have any investment in winning or losing. Uh, I think we lost I just you. Want to Are you there? Play well. Oh, yeah, there you I'm are. here. Okay. It just, right. 
You just cut out for a second. I thought I thought I lost you. Uh, I might have dropped for a little bit. But it, so um, backing up. So the Jedi approach to competition is to have a non-attached view to the outcome. Play your best, but don't be attached on on a winning outcome. And so, um, so how? So another, I was playing uh, mini golf with a girlfriend, right? And when she would do well, I would praise her and say I was happy. And she says, no, that's the wrong idea. It, it, it's only worth winning if you feel bad about losing. <laughs> and we're still connected? Yep, we are. Okay. So, <laughs> so that was the, the, like the non-Jedi you know, competition. You're gonna, and I feel good when you feel bad for losing. <laughs> you know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You know, wow. that's kind of like the non, non-Jedi non view of winning and losing. So so does that, does that kind of explain it a little bit? I mean, it's all in the essay. I don't want to paraphrase yeah. the whole essay. No, no, I, 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 that was the part, that was the part of it that, that uh, uh, struck me because, you know, David and I years ago did a show about uh, learning how to lose. And it was an exercise in losing on purpose to in an attempt to uh, attract that that you said it was like a non uh, excuse me a non Jedi uh, approach to winning and losing, we had this exercise where, where we would encourage people to lose on purpose to attract that uh, within themselves and then see how it felt. Um, and it was an interesting exercise. I, I had done it uh, myself before we ran that episode. And it, it it sucked. It didn't feel good. It does not feel good at all. But the more you understand both sides of it, as as your essay talked about, uh, the better understanding we can have of it overall. All right, uh, Christopher, I'm going to ask you the million dollar question, and it's going to be a hard question, but you know what's coming. <laughs> right. At, at their core, what makes a Jedi? What what core values and beliefs are held within um, that ideal Jedi? All right, so again, I borrow from Ovi McLeod, which is fine because he borrows from me all the time. Is that Jedi is a box? There, it is defined. If you're in the box, you're a Jedi. If you're out of the box, Jedi. Now, the shape and size of the box is up to some debate. But what what makes a Jedi? So I think. An adherence to the Jedi Code is one. Uh, I'm really big on having uh, non-attachment, mm-hmm. but there are there are, there's necessary attachments that you need to be a good. A lot of attachments that we have that we have to be able to let go of. I I think one of the foundational teachings of the Jedi path is the pillars of Jedi strength, the force, knowledge, and self-discipline. You got to have these three things to be a Jedi. I think that's crucial. And also, I think within the core knowledge is um, there's physical wellness, emotional wellness, intellectual wellness, social wellness, and spiritual wellness. I think to be a Jedi, you got to be cultivating these areas of your life. So how's, that's, that's about as succinct as I can be. Okay, fair enough. Um, it's a loaded question, of course. I mean, <laughs> right. you know, I, I, I like to ask it because it, it opens up that, that uh, perspective um, that each of us have. And I think, you know, of course – I always believe that there's there's more that makes us alike than dislike or that, that you know different. Um, but I love hearing those perspectives because it it creates conversations and and it it, it creates uh, thought. So we just talked about uh, in in your view what makes a Jedi, uh, who they are. Um, let's talk about training. 
Right. In your in your opinion, what are the important foundational things uh, a new Jedi should learn and practice from day one? Let's say someone walks onto your page and says, uh, "Teach me, oh great master." <laughs> I hope not. But <laughs> <laughs> so things to get into day one Jedi training. I think um, daily meditative practice is. Uh, I know that's a later question, but this is something we should start from day one. And you don't have to be good at it from day one. You just got to give it a try. I think um, physical wellness, you got to be active every day, gotta, even if it's something small. You know, it's like, and, uh, and study, study. Basically, the stuff I just outlaid in the last question, the mm-hmm. Jedi, uh, the pillars of Jedi strength, uh, being able to let go. Now, like, like yeah, so that's that's a, that's like kind of like the day one stuff. <laughs> so let's talk about meditation then. Do you do you have any tips for for us out here? Uh, meditation, like perspective, is different for everyone, and you know. I think if you gathered like a, a whole a whole bunch of Jedi uh, together and asked each of them about meditation, you could actually probably build the, the greatest um, uh, archive of meditation tips ever because they'll all be different. Do you have any tips for us? Right. So my tips for meditation, especially those new to it, is just hang in there. It's it's a lot like exercise. When you start exercising, you're only you're going to be limited in what you're able to do, and it's the same thing with meditation. Don't get hung up on how you should meditate, but just do it daily, right? And in time, mm-hmm. you will get better at it with practice. So, I, so this comes to um, one of the pillars of Jedi strength is self discipline. So you just gotta. Discipline yourself. It's like, okay, I'm going to take some time during my day, and I'm going to meditate, however you choose to meditate, whether it's the passive relaxing meditation while, or if it's guided visuals, you know, like or my favorite thing is the self-examination, you know, because, because of uh, an active mind uh, where you really – just, you know, it's kind of like deep thinking. You know, you sit and you puzzle at something, you really tear it apart, and you get it down to its very foundation. So mm-hmm. how's that? <laughs> That's great. Uh, and, and, you know, the one thing I – the only thing I ever have to contribute on meditation is this. Five minutes of meditation a day is better than zero minutes of meditation a day. You know, you'll get there. <laughs> you, right. You will get there. Right, or even two minutes when you're just starting. Yep. Because it can be, it can be a hard. Man, it was hard. It it was hard for me. (laughs) And, you know, like like a lot of people, especially when you, you know, it's hard. It's hard to be quiet and still, and it's hard to to focus in, in, in a really busy world. And a lot of us are busy. It's, it's, it can be hard at first, but, you know, 15 years later, so just, it's uh, not so hard. Aside, a, med- a meditation story. So, so, mm-hmm. uh, so California Jedi, we use the meetup site and we make our meetups public. So sometimes we get people that are brand new to the path or just interested in it, just to trying to check it out, coming to our meetups. And I do, I do this thing where we just train in the park, right? We're going to have Jedi training in the park. And there was one we had, and I did um, a meditation exercise that I got from my Aikido practice. And, and the guy's like, you know, things like oh i've never meditated i can't do it but i got them i got someone to meditate for the first time you know and it and it worked mm-hmm. you know so it's like so it's like if you're having trouble with meditation find a teacher <laughs> you know yeah that's, mm-hmm. <laughs> that'll help you out yep you don't have to do it on your own they were blown away too weren't they when you got them, when you got them there, they, they were just blown away. I bet they were there. They were there for the martial arts because we were doing martial arts that day. Yeah, mm-hmm. they were martial artists and stuff. So it was, it was kind of it was it was fun. 
That's cool. You wrote a you wrote a uh, another article uh, called "We Are All Padawans: Cultivating the Attitude of a Learner." We talked about uh, day one Jedi stuff, Jedi one hundred and one. What uh, what does Jedi one hundred one hundred and two look like for for continued training? <laughs> right. So for for that essay, it's it's more about um, attitude. You know knowing that there's always something else that we're going to learn, right? And it's kind, it was kind of like addressing, I mean, we've all seen it, the people that think they have it all, they know it all, right? Mm-hmm. That, they have, that they have all the answers and their ideas are the right ideas and their way is the right way and advancing them otherwise. But if you have the attitude of a learner, you, you kind of, and it ties into the second line of the Jedi Code, ignorance yet knowledge, is that we may be mistaken about a great many things, about everything. And being open to the, to the idea that we might be mistaken about something gives us the opportunity to learn. And so... Well, for Jedi 102, I would say that it's more attitudinal stuff, you know, shaping your attitudes, becoming more in line with the Jedi. And one of those attitudes is that you can always learn something today. There's no one you will meet that you can't learn something from. Anyone. There's, some, there's something that they'll know that you don't know. Yeah, I would agree. Mm-hmm. I I like to think that I'm wrong about more things every day than I am right, and then the next day I just add another thing, you know. Right. Uh, let's talk about ranks and hierarchies as it applies to to the Jedi. Um, and of course, an individual Jedi may or may not have a rank or a hierarchy. Some carry titles. Uh, what are your thoughts on on those things? This goes back to my early uh, time in the Jedi community back in 2005. I was involved with a group called the Jedi Sanctuary. I'm the, I'm just, I'm not, are you familiar with the Jedi Sanctuary? I, I, I certainly am. <laughs> right? And so in the Jedi Sanctuary, they were very like, we have no titles here. Right? It's like everyone is a Jedi, and that's all that counts. And that, that kind of influence. When I set up Jedi Path and the Jedi Path Academy, I mean, I could have said, okay, this is my playground. I'm doing the content. I could, I could be Grandmaster, right? I had the opportunity to do that because I have my own site. You know, it's like, you know, I'm my own master. It's like, I could be Grandmaster. But instead... You know, so when I set up the Facebook page, you had to have like a like a title. Right. For me, I put like something like head windmill tilter, like a Don Quixote <laughs> reference. I yeah, right? I've seen that. <laughs> right. So it's just so it's kind of like a non-title, you know, and kind of kind of a, kind of a joke about the chaotic Jedi. So. When it comes to it, I don't. I think the important part is being a Jedi. And it wasn't until recently that I found a title that I want to aspire to. So I'm aspiring to meet the knighthood standards of California Jedi. Mm-hmm. And I've been, I've been. And when I did that, I put a braid in my hair as an external symbol. Of like, okay, I'm not there yet. I'm not yet a knight, but I'm going to work. I have I set my intention to become a knight, and when I am a knight, I'll paid. You know, so what? It, why I kind of shied away from titles in the past because there wasn't any titles that really engaged me. Mm-hmm. That said, yes, that is worthy of pursuit. You know, 
until I got to, the, until I started doing the offline Jedi stuff. I was involved with California Jedi and they have the knighthood standards. And so, place. But I also think it's often misused. So that's, that's kind of my views on ranks and hierarchies. Sure. I think they would certainly carry more more use offline than they would online. I, w- I would agree with that. Right, because um, especially, you know, because we were talking about Second Life, in an mm-hmm. online environment, you can shape yourself into anything you want. You mm-hmm. can be anything online. Online. I choose to be sincere. Mm-hmm. That's what I choose to be. But yeah, so offline, yeah, because these are people that know me, that have spent time with me, have a good, know the trials I've gone through and stuff. And it, and it, and it really would have meaning to me to have the, um, to meet the, so it's not, it's not having the title that, but it's meeting the standards, mm-hmm. right? That these standards, are something that I think are worthy, you know? Well, and you could be held accountable, uh, accountable to them uh, face-to-face, you know? It's really hard to hold somebody accountable over, over the Internet. But face-to-face, yeah, you can exactly. – and, and it's not just about accountability. It's about, you know, working together face-to-face. It's, right. it's, just, it's just the thing to do. I have a question for you from the chat. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see here. What are your thoughts on the divisions within the community between sites? Uh, will there ever be a true unification of the Jedi as a whole, or should there be, if not? Yeah, I don't think there will be. You know, I'm, I'm kind of pragmatic about it because we all have mm-hmm. our own ideas about what it is to be Jedi. Again, talking about that box, it's a big box inside the Jedi, and there's very many be a Jedi. But there, there's some things in common, and then there's the flourishes. You know, there's the individuality. We all have a common path, but the way we walk it will be individual. And a lot of the Unity projects that I've seen over the years turns out to be mechanisms of control, mm-hmm. right? It's like we we want to be what the Jedi are, and so we want them to come under our umbrella. Yep. So, I've been dragged and, into many of those over the years, by the way. <laughs> I don't right, know exactly what you're worked, saying. Yep. Right? Uh-uh, you know, right? They never, these, these Jedi unity movements never work. They always fall apart. And I think it's okay to be individual but have this common cause that we're all Jedi. And the real differences come unimportant because we all agree on what a Jedi is to some point. And if we could just be Jedi, then that's what we are. Organizationally, there are going to be different organizations that serve different needs. Mm -hmm. And so... There's a place for that, you know, but I don't, I don't think there's a, a one size fits all Jedi solution. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. Pe- people tend to forget that e- even the, the largest religions that, that exist today started out much like we are in that there are all these different uh, uh, variations. Now, hopefully we don't all go kill each other off to get to one like they did with many of those other religions. But that, I I mean, we're young, we're still young in the grand scheme of things. You know, we have religions and philosophies that that have thousands of years uh, of trial and error on us. And I just think we have to kind of look at it that way that we're, we're, we're growing and moving. I think the key is this, this offline movement, is I think the key. I think that's the closest thing we're going to come to it because again, face to face interaction is a lot different than uh, talking to somebody over the internet. I really do believe that. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And, and I like that we're in a space now where these offline communities 
it happening and growing. You know, it's it's mm-hmm. it's a good time to be Jedi. <laughs> Speaking of offline groups, you need to put a good word in for me, Christopher, and get your group on uh, sometime soon so we can talk about uh, your offline group. We have Indiana Jedi coming on um, tomorrow night. I'll have Connor representing them. Right. Let's see here. Um, I need to check something real quick. So we are down to uh, roughly 11 minutes. So I want to pick out one or two of these questions that we have left. Um some of the good ones here. Uh, we talked about – actually, one of the questions that we kind of hit on uh, – let's see here. Here's, here's a question. Here's a question uh, that I want to ask you. Out of all the things you've written over the years – I know this is probably a lot of stuff. What's, what's been your favorite work to date? Um, I think that would have to be uh, the essay, the, the Jedi view of romance and intimacy. Right, and that that kind of speaks, especially to people that are new on the path, because there's because we have this Star Wars mythology where Jedi were not to be married, they weren't to have romantic relationships. You know, that's like the whole thing that caused Anakin Skywalker to fall to the dark side, right? But as human beings, we need that kind of connection. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote this essay that's kind of like the Jedi view of romance and intimacy, which deals with, again, this has been a big theme during this interview with non-attachment. You know, it's, it's accepting the people you're with as they are without having set expectations, without having a feeling of possession, right? You know, it's mm-hmm. being able to let go because uh, everything's relationships and all relationships one way or another come to an end either through uh, distance or death or disagreement right and it's being able to to, uh, let go and not be possessive that you can love as a Jedi I just I I like it because it's um, because it's one of the things that's most misunderstood, especially to people outside of the path. You know, like if you're if you're a Jedi, how can you have a boyfriend? How can you have a, a girlfriend if you're a Jedi? It's like, well, you do it as a Jedi would do it. And mm-hmm. that essay explains how. I talked about uh, at the beginning of the show when I was introducing your page. And uh, where is it? I'm going to quote it again real quick. You will find no promises of any fantastic powers or abilities beyond those which can be obtained through hard work and training. Uh, Let's talk about mysticism uh, within uh, the Jedi path. Uh, Let's see here. Do you you, uh, uh, subscribe to any kind of metaphysical practices uh, in the training that you do or or the the stuff you teach? Or uh, how how do you do that stuff? Not really. I, I say that with a caveat. So it's like, so I'm very pragmatic. I'm like, if, if I'm to believe this thing is real, uh, measurable, you know, objective facts, and anything metaphysical or um, paranormal so far has not been able to be examined that way. You know, James Randi had that million-dollar prize for anyone that could prove the paranormal, and no one's been able to claim it when it's when it's been tested. So I act, but I have an evolving relationship with energy work because um, doing Aikido, we use uh, ki, and there was a while where I said, okay, ki is nothing but posture and kinesthetics, you know, body mechanics. And I tried that, and I found that if I didn't use the key imagery, my Aikido didn't work. So there's something there. I don't know what it is, but I don't think that the mystical explanations are the right explanation. But I do not know what the right explanation is, (laughs) if Mm -hmm. that makes sense. 
Sure. It's a well, my views are evolving. Oh, that's that's fair, and and I think that's probably the best way to look at anything. Um, you know, we should always be evolving, and I just I pick I picked on that because back in the day, and you'll remember this probably. Back in the day, there were places that you would go, and it was all about making you a superhero. And right. you know, they would go they would go really far off. Um, I think there's a place for mysticism. I think there's a place for pragmat, you know, being pragmatic. I think there's a place for metaphysical stuff. I just think it just, it just depends on 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 where you might be at. Um, you know, of course, I'm not saying that. Uh, you know, I, I I truly believe in in uh, moving things in my mind, tele- telekinesis or something, just yet. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. I suppose I just haven't seen it yet. So. Right. It's never been demonstrated to any satisfaction, which is right. so, but, but in second life, my character master Zen, he's a complete mystic. So, <laughs> but, but, in, but in, but in the fictional narrative, this, the force really is a thing that can move objects and stuff. And it's simulated in second life. Or metaphysics through uh, the role play, but I don't, I don't, I don't, have a, a concrete belief in it in real life. So in like three years, I, I, I'm going to approach you at a, at a gathering and I'm going to say, Hey, how do you feel about being a mystic now? Right. <laughs> like, All right. So it, it's always been a tradition at the Knights of Awakening that at the, at the end of a conversation with a guest that we open the floor up and have uh, you leave our audience with some final thoughts. Um, but before we do that, I want you to tell everyone where they can find your work and so we can get them over there and, and check your stuff out. Right. So over audio, the easiest address to remember is JediPath.org. And JediPath.org will have links to all the ways you can contact me. It will have a link to the Facebook page. And we even have – uh, IRC chat room that you can get through the web page, or if you have an IRC client, client you can uh, go to channel Jedi Path on. Um, oh, where are we? I can't remember the IRC network, but it's it's on the web page. <laughs> <laughs> are there any final thoughts you wish to leave with the uh, with our knights out there? Um, no, I want to plug my upcoming book on the Jedi Path website has been expanded upon and is being put in um, book form. It's called Your First Step into a Larger World, um, A Beginner's Guide to the, or basically your, an introduction to the Jedi Path. It's an introductory work for people that are not Jedi yet. So it's not really so much for the Jedi community, but to those mm-hmm. who want to begin being a Jedi. So... I'm starting. And where would they be able to? Where would they be able to find that? Are, are, are you going to self-publish that, or are you going to put it through the? Uh, I'm going to. I'm going to use CreateSpace on which okay. is an Amazon company. So, it, so you'll be able to get it through Amazon. And shortly after I do the paper book, I'm going to do a Kindle version, so you can get get that on Amazon and CreateSpace. We can get it on BN.com. And stuff, but on on retailers, you won't be able to find it in shops or anything. But it's going to be be self published through uh, the Amazon server. The the whole self publishing movement is, is is taking a big hold, and I love it when people use it because it gives, you know, the average Joe like me and you a, a chance to get our stuff out there. I was when you when you do publish the book, make sure you let me know, and uh, we'll do a review, and we'll give some copies away, and. Uh, We'll have you back on to talk about it then. Sounds good. Hopefully, hopefully. I want to thank you so very much, uh, sincerely, for coming on. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said, uh, put in a good word for me over there at uh, CA Jedi. Uh, I'd love to get them on and talk about uh, the good work they do over there, too. All right. I'll let the people know. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thank you for have having a good me. night. Good night. It, it, was, it was a pleasure. All right, everyone. That was L. Christopher Bird of the Jedi Path webpage, um, a member of California Jedi offline group.
uh, head over to KOA, uh, the KOA page at uh, uh, on Facebook. Check out our YouTube page. If you like the videos there, uh, please subscribe, please like, please share. And that'll do it for tonight. So again, I want to thank Christopher Bird for joining me. I want to thank all of you for joining me. I love you all very much. 